Welcome to Making It Happen, a career in the performing arts, where we discuss how to break into the performing arts industry for yourself or your child, teen or young adult. Guests include artists, creatives, casting directors, musical directors, choreographers, agents and managers, as well as parents of young professional actor, singer, dancers, all who are passionate and share my vision of helping talented individuals land professional representation and have successful careers in the arts. My name is Lisa Solak and I am the CEO and founder of Making It Happen, a career in the performing arts, having helped hundreds of clients break into the business on stage in films, television, commercial work, and more. This podcast is supplemental to my groundbreaking online courses, Professional Kids and Teens 101, a primer for parents, and Professional Biz 201 for young adults, college students, and graduates. For more information, check out all the ways you can benefit from my courses, programs, free weekly newsletters, and free guides. You can go to lbctalent.com. My guest today is Diana DiMarzio. Hi, Diana, how are you? I'm so happy to have you. I can't get over how accredited you are in this industry. It's incredible. Well, that's nice of you to say, Lisa. <laughs> um, you have to be a self-promoter nowadays with all of the social media. And I'm not a social media person. Oh, anyway, I've been through some things. <laughs> I've learned a lot. And if I had to do it all over again, I probably would do the same exact thing I did. Because, you know. The listeners are interested in, obviously, your journey. And they're also interested in any tips and tricks, advice that you can give as we discuss all of that that you have done. And I think first, let's talk about the work that you've done because you've been on Broadway more than once and you've done numerous national tours. So just tell us a little bit about what's on that resume. Like give us an idea of what's there. Uh, I moved to New York to be on Broadway. And that, I mean, that was a dream of mine since I was a kid. I never even thought of another kind of career. And uh, when I moved to New York, I didn't care if I was third girl on the left in Les Mis. I just wanted to be on Broadway. And the way it happened was pretty much of a dream. I could not have written that journey any better than it happened. So I consider myself extremely lucky. And if I had to quit now, it would be fine because <laughs> I did what I moved to New York to do. I got to my debut on Broadway was playing opposite Patti Lapone in as the beggar woman in Sweeney Todd on Broadway. And Dude. I had to go in and sing for Sondheim, which I thought probably I would have a heart attack when I got that call. And a friend of mine had to talk me into a place of calm. I'll, I'll just have to tell you how it happened, actually. I didn't have an agent at the time. And I had read about Sweeney Todd coming to Broadway, but they were doing it with instruments where, you know, they, they wanted each character to play a certain amount of instruments. And the, the instrument that uh, they wanted the beggar woman to play, which would have been the only role I could have played other than okay. Mrs. Lovett, who of course they were going to have a star play, mm -hmm. um, was the beggar woman. And they wanted her to play the clarinet. And I used to play in high school. I played the clarinet in high school. However, I never liked the instrument. So I never took it seriously okay. enough. So I said, this is mine. And I had sent in a picture and resume to the casting and they actually called me in. And I, I thought that I had given a good audition, but never heard a thing, never heard. Okay. And so they had, that was the screening process. And they then called in um, whom they had chosen to meet the director who was from England. And the director came in. And I remember he, he told this story. So th this is why I know this story. Okay, okay, okay. okay. After rehearsals, he sat down and told us this story, but he wasn't happy. And for some reason, he went back to England. I didn't get a call back, by the way. And he went back to England and they decided to do it more commercially. They decided, let's do a bigger, different casting. And so they got uh, Telsey casting. And I had sent a picture in to Telsey. And uh, so I had read that they were, they if you had auditioned months ago for Sweeney Todd, please re-audition because uh, they changed all the creatives, everything was changed. And so now it was Telsey casting. So I went ahead to the same exact thing and I sent my picture and resume into Telsey and I did not get an appointment. Uh, how am I gonna make this happen? I gotta make this happen. 
So I got up that day of the audition at 5 a.m., whatever. I was in line at 5 a.m. I said, I'm doing this with my instrument. And I also played the piano. They only have a hundred at the time they had 120 slots. So if you weren't one of the first 120 people in line, you were not sure. going to get an appointment. And I had to get an appointment. So I got there early enough to get an appointment. I walked in and I just remember the casting director, he had seen so many, I guess, already, but he was sitting back on his chair and I had intended on playing two instruments and singing. So when I walked in, he said, what would you like to do first? And I said, well, I could sing and play at the same time. He said, okay, fine. You know, so I sat down at the piano. I sang a little bit of Green Finch and Linnet Bird, which is the the little, the ingenue of Sweeney Todd, which I, I wasn't, um, sure. they wanted it to be a Sondheim song. So that was the Sondheim song I had worked on, like extremely intensively on that <laughs> piano to make that happen, right? <laughs> okay. I sang a few bars. I got a, okay, fine. That's, that's good. Thank you. And then he said, uh, what instrument are you going to play? I could tell it was, there wasn't, it did not seem like there was a lot of interest there. Okay. And so he said, what instrument are you going to play? And I said, uh, clarinet. And he said, okay, fine. So I had music for the accompanist and my clarinet had been sitting on the piano. And I said, it's probably out of tune. So I'm going to need to tune with piano. So I said to the pianist, can I have a B flat, please? And he looked at the casting director and said, first one all day. So now instead of the casting director sitting back here, he went like this and all of a sudden seemed a bit more interested because the pianist had told him that I was a serious musician. That's incredible. Yeah. And all of a sudden my adrenaline got a little tune up and I played and wouldn't you know, I got a call back. Amazing. Because of that one little thing that the Moment. pianist said, I'm thinking. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what's going on in my head. Yeah. I go, when the callback was seeing the director. Mm -hmm. And I, that never really happens like that. You probably go through another, like another process of uh, screening. But this director came from England and they do things differently in England. Yeah. And yes. he wanted to be there. And so he came in and he probably kept me in the room for about 20 minutes or so and just wow. worked with like I played, just briefly played the clarinet, briefly played the piano. Now he was more interested in acting and, and it was a whole other um, interpretation of what Sweeney Todd usually was, okay. you know, or set in an, in an insane asylum. And, and uh, so he was trying to get us to, you know, act whatever, crazy, whatever. Crazy. Think a little bit outside of the box kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, outside of the box. And it was just so interesting. And, um, you know, I, I just had a, I had a really fun time working with him in that room. In the audition. In the audition. Okay. Like it was, it didn't feel like an audition. It felt like just a work session, like a fun work oh, session. Oh, so cool. English director. So cool. And uh, I, like I left there on a complete high. Sure. And, uh, the next day I got the call, I got another call back to come in for the producers and, and then, oh, actually it was for the music director. They said music director, but when I walked in and I'm not kidding, there were like 50 people behind that table. Was that intimidating? I saw Richard Frankel, who was, who was uh, producing it, just the biggest smile on his face. And they just made me feel so comfortable, you yeah, know, even welcome. though I was nervous beyond beyond belief but again I, I did exactly what I did I played the clarinet I played the piano I sang I acted in that scene that the same scene that he had given me and I got a thank you that yeah. quick thank you and I thought okay that's the kiss of death right maybe they knew maybe they knew that they wanted you in that moment and they didn't need to see anything else well th so that was like, I don't know if that was like a Tuesday or Wednesday. I don't remember, but fr th that happened. I didn't hear anything. I'm like, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Friday, I get the call. And that was the time we had answering services. Yes, had I remember. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or we, I think there were cell phones, but I refused to get one. I didn't <laughs> want to get one because I, I didn't want to. I was so sick of everyone walking down the street on, in New York with their cell phones. So I decided not to get one. And mm -hmm. I had an answering service every hour that day. I was checking my cell phone. Not, I mean, my... um my answering service, nothing, 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 7 p.m. So don't think the day ends in casting at five. It doesn't. <laughs> That's 7 a good p.m. I checked it and it, it it didn't ring. It just clicked right up. And they said, you have an audition on Tuesday for Stephen Sondheim. And that's when I thought, 
Like I, I couldn't even finish the message. I hung it up. I was so, I, I, I couldn't even imagine singing for him that I hurry up and hung up the- You were just overwhelmed. I was too overwhelmed. And then I had yeah. to listen to it again after I like, is this happening? Is this real? Is this, <laughs> I'm singing for Stephen Sondheim, whom? How, how do you get to sing for him? Like that, I didn't even have that on my bucket list. It, it seemed too okay, long, okay. <laughs> too, too much. <laughs> too far fetched. So, okay. Like, like third girl in the left court, you know. Yeah. Like, so that's when a friend of mine had to talk me off the ledge and said, okay, you know what? He was like, this isn't about kicking your leg up here. This isn't about having a certain color hair, or being a certain color. This is about something specific that you have in your repertoire as far as an instrument or two or a look or whatever. It wasn't about having to compete with the 500 other women exactly. who might have longer legs or, or taller or different color hair or eyes. Like this was, he was like, now it's your turn. Yes. Yeah. And I thought about that and I was like, why couldn't it be my turn? Yeah. Why, why can't it be my turn? Mm -hmm. You know, so um, it took, that was a Friday and I had until a Tuesday to talk myself into <laughs> the place. And I Into did. being able to sing for Sondheim. Yes. Yeah, because I was singing for Sondheim. So I did not, I didn't associate with anybody. I like went and hit out. I didn't want to have anybody giving me any other advice. That was a I, good idea. That was yeah. a good idea. To yeah. almost recluse, like to recluse yourself so that you could focus. focus That's what, that was that, a... Yes, because when you get other voices in your head that are telling you, say, oh, well, make sure you this or make sure you that, or stay away from everybody. Go into your little place and do what you have to do for you. I love focus. That. And that's exactly what I did for that. And I walked in that night. It, it was in the night, that audition. It was a okay. Tuesday night. Okay. Cindy Lauper was there. She, she was, she was up for um, Mrs. Lovett. Okay. Um, there were people, there was like one for each role. And I thought, where's everybody else? And I'm like, is this like, is this, is this, this it? could be it. Like this could be getting his approval. Mm -hmm. This was getting Oh, okay. Casting was showing approval. who they thought. Okay. Understood. And so when uh, Bernie Telsey came out and this was the first time, Bert, no, I think he, he might've been in the producer call, but I, but he was definitely in this call because our director wasn't there. And Bernie Telsey came out and he said, everybody do exactly what you've been doing mm -hmm. in every one of these auditions. Do not change a thing. Mm -hmm. The director wasn't there. The way the director had me, uh, all of the previous auditions was very, very small. Okay. Like just like singing small, everything small, mm -hmm. like just sort of, cause it was like, I was supposed to be in a, he wanted her to be sort of like a comatose. So it was just sort of like very small. And I went in and I went to shake Sondheim's hand. He was sitting at the table and I went and he didn't extend. <laughs> he was like, oh my God. <laughs> So I already felt small enough, right? And so I went, I went to, to to sit in my spot the way I had been doing it for the director, and Sondheim cut me off. I, I don't know what you're doing. I, I don't I don't know what that is. He was like, "Can you just sing it?" Wow. <laughs> so okay. So I went full out differently than I had been doing it. Okay. Oh, okay. Previous audition, and he was like, "Okay, all right. Now I understand." I understand your voice. He was like, can you sing something for me? And um, I, I said, one of your songs. And he was like, whatever, I don't care. Just sing anything. And and as I was singing, I, I did Greenfinch again. But as I was singing, I could feel my nerves. I could mm -hmm. feel my nerves. And I I said, are you going to be the reason you don't get this? Are you actually? And I switched off the light. You actually said that in your own head? In my head as I was singing. I'm like, I wasn't, I wasn't invested in the story I was telling I was thinking about how I wasn't going to get this because my voice was and I said oh I'm not going to be the reason I have prepared myself this far that's you know this gone through the whole process and now now I'm going to like I'm going to be the one and I said no way so I literally just turned on the light bulb and said no and no. I, I I did it and he cut me off and he was like okay great and then he just wanted to know like my high, my highs, my lows, whatever. And then sure. the next day, the next day I got the call from um, Craig Burns, tell, uh, Craig Burns at Telsey. And I can't, can't remember who the, but he was like, hold on. He called me. I did have a cell phone. I did have a cell phone, but uh, <laughs> I still, 
I still had my service. But anyway, he called me on the cell phone. I was walking in the middle of the street and he, he said, hold on, hold on. I have something to say, but I'm going to get, I can't remember who else on the phone. Okay. And he got her on the phone. He was like, you ready? And he said, just tell me. He was like, you got, you, you got it. You got, and I literally thought if I ever heard those words finally about, cause it was a little later in life for me, it didn't happen like friends, which I will get into later, but, okay. but it was a little bit later in life. And I, I always went through like what that would feel like when it happened. Like, are you going to be able to contain yourself? Are you going <laughs> jumping for joy? Are you going to hurt yourself? Like falling <laughs> off the couch from, from excitement. And it literally was absolute opposite. It was the absolute, it was really? like wave of calm and relief that went through my body because it was validation all of a sudden. Yeah, you're giving me chills. This is amazing. What an amazing story. Oh my gosh. It was just, uh, you know, I couldn't even, and, and then, you know, of course I called home and called my friends and, but it was, it was such a, like, I've never been a calmer, a, a, in a calmer place than in that. that moment in that moment that's so an incredible it, story. it never happens like we think mm -hmm. it's going to happen mm -hmm. and that's the beauty of it like we can't plan we cannot plan what's going to happen what we can do is prepare we prepare as best we can because you never know when you're going to gain the opportunity and you, you know if i just thought i'll wing it let, i'll just wing this i am because Actually, I had not played that instrument in a lot, in 20 years. I had not played oh, that. Oh, okay, instrument. okay. And I said, this is mine, remember? Yeah, you're going to get it. This is mine. So I went to to a 47th Street with all those instruments. And I, I went in and I told the guy, I said, I need to rent the best clarinet you have in this place. The best clarinet. He was like, how mm -hmm. long do you want it? And I said, as long, I don't know, just. I'll, I'll put whatever. And I, yep. I went home and my lips were black and blue. I'm not even kidding. My lips were black and blue. How much I practiced that thing. Because you know what, Diana, I love that story because I think preparedness is everything. And I think you have to think outside of the box, which you also mentioned, and you have to have initiative and you have to have guts in that moment and grit in that moment. And I'm sure there was a lot of other things going on in your life at the time that you needed to just go, okay, this is my focus. This is what I'm going to do. And for you to go get a clarinet, practice like crazy, because you knew that that was a role that you could play. And you wanted to make sure that they knew that. And somebody else who would be maybe, I hate to use the word lazy, but there are, you know, some people who just throw opportunity away by not being prepared. So that that's amazing that you did that. I am totally a fan of preparedness. I think that is like one of the most important things. And I think you learn that sometimes from your own parents, the, you know, having grit, having to be, push yourself when you're super busy. In this case, it was definitely a short-term goal, but maybe talk a little bit about your background, about your upbringing, how you ended up landing in a collegiate program. So give us well, a little bit of a background regarding your, um, maybe your upbringing and where you learned that grittiness. Like you, you definitely have that about you which is obviously something that has made you so successful but where you learned that and how you landed in a musical theater program or or whatever type of program that you had collegiately that led you to this you know i grew up uh i grew up in a suburban town uh, near pittsburgh my mom came from an italian immigrant family and my father was actually from italy and i've never met two more harder working people than my parents Mm -hmm. And I was, I was working as a child. Like I, I was cleaning my dad, his pride and joy was his, was his garden. And like, it wasn't like I didn't have to do chores or, or clean the vegetables from his gardens. Like, and they would can tomatoes. Like I came from a very Italian immigrant -y kind of okay. family. Okay. And wait, where did you grow up exactly again? Where did you grow up? It, it's, it's Ambridge, Pennsylvania. It's about 20 miles southwest I believe of Pittsburgh okay and um yeah the work ethic was instilled in me from a very very young age mm -hmm. nothing was going to be handed to me ever you Same. you have to work for everything mm -hmm. okay yeah. and there's something about that 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 stays with you as an adult if you're passionate about something you're going to put the work into it 
So when I said wing it or what, yeah, you might in this business, you might have five auditions in one day. If you're lucky, you're going to really want at least one of those that you're going to put more focus or work into that one, yes. but you still have to go to these other ones, right? So to prepare for all of them, yeah, might be a huge feat, but when you know that, that this is the one, it, it wasn't fitting a square peg in a, in a round hole. It was fitting a round peg in a round hole. Like this had to be, and the only thing that was going to stand in that way was myself. Mm -hmm. yes. So we cannot self-sabotage. And, and one of the ways we do that is by thinking, oh, well, I'll just wait and we'll see. Like maybe I'm sure I'm going to, oh, I'll just wait. Because how many times, sometimes we have to do that. We have to, you know, maybe live in the moment and read, you, you know, the, the side because you'd have time to work on it. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, just be in the moment then. Like you don't know what, you know, that's life. Be in the moment. And yes. but other times there is an absolute way that you can do the work. So yes. you know that you're going to go in there and give, and all you can do is give the best of that day. And yes, yes absolutely. I totally agree with you. I think, yeah. I think too, sometimes you can only, you can only do as much as you can. Obviously our days are filled with lots of different things. And like you're saying, if you really want that role, you're going to put as much time into it as you can in that moment. And there are going to be other times where you don't have that kind of time. And so you're going to have to do the best you can in the room. I think right is your point. I do have many clients who do put quite a bit of time into preparing for whatever that audition is. And I think as a person who is pursuing this career, you have to understand that there always could be somebody else that could be doing more than you're doing. So you want to do as much as you possibly can. Yeah, there's going to be those people who even don't show up because it's raining or don't show up because it's snowing or don't show up, you know what I mean? Because they they just feel like it's too much effort even to just get there. There are going to be those people that are going to fall by the wayside, but then you have a whole faction of people that want it as bad as you do. So you have to realize that in the moment and don't, don't just think I'm just very talented. And so they should automatically just give me a call back. And I think there is a little bit of that going on these days that people don't really realize how much people do care and and do put in the work and do the research about the character and check other performances by other people, like all the different things that you would do to get yourself ready. So I think, I think that's a, having that grit and being able to adjust your schedule, even just being able to plan ahead, you know, and make sure you don't wait till the last minute. I think there's a lot of people, especially in this world of cell phones in this world of all everything's coming at these younger actors so quickly. They're so used to everything happening, happening so fast that I think they do have to slow down a little bit. And okay, if casting sends you the entire script, you better read it. You better understand your character and the relationships. Don't just memorize the sides and go in the door and think. So that's just, yeah, it's an amazing story what you went through, especially the fact that you had, you took such initiative to just go after that. It's just amazing. So did they teach you some of that when you were at the collegiate level? Like how did that hold uh, transpire? And prior to that, when did you realize that musical theater or that vo vocal performance was going to be your thing? I always knew. I consider myself lucky for knowing exactly what I wanted to do in life because people in freshmen in college colleges might just be, you know, arts and sciences or whatever. They don't know. And I'm like, how could you not know? Every Not everybody knows what they want to do for the rest of their life. And I think that was so foreign to me because I always did. Ever since I was a kid, I was, I never, ever, I don't know where that came from either because my family was not musical, a musical or a theatrical. Oh, family. they weren't in the arts. No. You're, you're anybody in your family, grandparents, well, anybody? How funny, my, my two aunts, they played accordion. Oh, they did? Okay. <laughs> they were okay. playing at theme parks and on the radio shows and everything. And that was the old, but that wasn't my parent. My mom didn't. Okay. My mom loved it. And, and so did my dad, but neither of them were uh, musically inclined or anything. So I have no idea how that happened. My sister did. Like I followed in her footsteps with with the clarinet because she played. So I played and I only had one sister and she was older. So I was like, did everything my sister did. But okay. I don't know where that came from but I considered myself lucky to know what I wanted to do like I yeah. never had to hmm it, it is just you know what that's interesting because it's it's interesting for parents too because when you have a young child you want them to try lots of different things 
And so you put them in t-ball when they're really little, or they try soccer, like all the things the neighbors are doing. And lots of times you do it based on your neighbors and the people that live near you. And you're okay. All the children are going to go try soccer on Saturday morning. And they try all these different things. And it is sometimes it takes a while for them to understand or to see what they have an affinity for, plus what they would love to do. Cause you obviously don't want to push your child or teen into something that they don't love or that they don't have some talent for. So I, it's interesting that you say that because I think it is magical when you have a young person who has the talent and ability, knows what they want, and will have the insight to actually go after it. So were you in that place mentally when you were like a teen? Like, did you know this is it? I remember, I don't know, I I guess it was that sixth sense or something, but I remember I was in seventh grade and I was walking to class and one of my teachers said to me, "Um, you like to sing? And I said, yes. And he he said, do you want to study this when you get older in college? And I said, yes, I'm going to go to Carnegie Mellon and I want to study voice. How did I know that at seventh grade? How in the world did I ever know that? I swear, I do not know how I knew oh that. Oh my gosh, I'm losing it over here. He That's incredible. Door, and I walked in, in seventh grade. I'm going to Carnegie Mellon and I'm going to study voice. And that's exactly what I did. I went to Carnegie Mellon and I studied voice. How did I know that at that age? I don't know. And it's incredible that you got into the school. The school is like the top or one of the top three, if not the top school for musical theater and all of that in this country. And here you were having that opportunity. I didn't even audition for any other schools. That's either. That was my one and only school. No one does that. I don't know. How did my parents let me do that either? Like, <laughs> you know, how did they even? Like, I, I don't even, I, I don't know. Maybe they thought, oh, she's like, whatever. I don't know how. Did but your pa- were your parents supportive? Very. Um, so my mom, my mom definitely was. My dad, I felt like played along until I got accepted to Carnegie Mellon when he knew, I think she's really going to want to make a living out of this. And then with his Italian accent, oh, what are you going to (laughs) do? What are you going to do when you get out? Like, what are you going to do? And literally, not just, I'll segue into that, into that moment. What am I going to do when I get out? That graduation day was probably the, one of the most depressing days of my life. I remember I graduated from Carnegie Mellon with a vocal degree and I went home after all the festivities. What in the world am I going to do now? What do I do with this? How do, like, now what? What do you do with a vocal performance degree? It's so, that is, well, that's the reason we're doing these podcasts, you know, to just share with people because this is a story that I still hear and that forced me into and pushed me into being able to give this information and have all this information out there because so many young people are doing exactly that still to this day. They are coming out of school and then they don't know where to go. They don't know which way to turn. They don't know how to find representation. They don't understand any of it. So again, thank you for that because it's so great having you so that you could share this because then it won't seem so foreign as Mm -hmm. well. And hopefully this can help kind of shed some light. So you said earlier that you did not have representation when you auditioned for Sondheim. You didn't have representation when you auditioned for Sondheim. How? I made it happen happen myself. (laughs) You did make it happen yourself, but that's, well, you know what? There's another reason that I think even people who are represented by managers and agents need to also put in the work. You still have to look for the projects. You still have to stay on top of it. But back then too, it's hard because we didn't have as much information coming at us. And so it was hard to figure it out. Did you have any friends that were already there? How did you end up in New York City? Oh, oh, sure. Um, Absolutely. Did I have friends? You know, uh, my best friend that I went all through my four years of college with, the minute, like we all moved to New York at the same time. Mm -hmm. And the minute she moved to New York, she got a Broadway show. What? Yes, she got a Broadway show. She she played, um, she was the original Aya in Secret Garden. And, you know, and so what do we do? We compare ourselves to our friends. 
right away, especially if, you know, you, you, you're best friends with and, and, and you go through the whole four year program and you all move to New York together. And then what do we do? We start comparing our journey to everybody else's mm -hmm. and they already did it. How am I going to, you know, and then the panic hits, panic hits. And so what do we do? Do we do we drop out? Do we think our parents might have been right? But I, I, I'll tell you a story because, like I said, it took me a little, little bit longer, <laughs> a little, little bit longer than some of my friends. And sure. and here's where when you say, did your parents support you? Um, I, I don't want to scare anyone who's listening to this podcast who is afraid of New York, but in my apartment, um, uh, my apartment had been robbed. I, I came home one night and my apartment had been robbed. And so I went through the whole thing and I was looking for a new place and everything. And of course my mother was so scared because her youngest daughter was in New York alone and now she was robbed and oh my gosh, come home, come home, right? And so my mom who has was always the most supportive person, she actually said the words, and I said, I can't come home yet. It hasn't happened. And she said, well, if it hasn't happened now, then it's probably never going to happen. So just face the fact and come home. And I literally hung up on her. Oh my goodness. I said, if I don't have the support from my like biggest cheerleader, how in the world? And I hung up on her and I was like, oh no, now I'm really going to do it. Yeah. And so, and she called back and she apologized. She was like, I'm just scared. I'm just scared. It, it, yeah. it, I, it's not that I don't think you can't do it. Sure. I'm scared. She lit so, a fire under you. Like those voices, all the voices in your head throughout your journey are going to, you're going to listen to them. So you get to choose which ones you're going to listen to. How about we just listen to our own and forget all the other ones? Because your voice is probably the one that's, that has the most validity and the one that is the truest. Yes. The one that knows your you truth. Want it, not because other people are afraid yes. or other people don't want you to, like, whatever the reason, you got to listen to your own voice. Yes. Get the voices out of your head. Yes. So. Yes. Absolutely. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. It's so true that we need to be listening to our own voices and not being affected by all of these other, this outside information. And I feel like for young people today, they're also dealing with social media and they're seeing all of these things that their friends are posting and thinking, how come these aren't happening to me? And I think there's ways that you can shift your thinking and you can look for opportunities and look for not only opportunities to be present in a moment, but also opportunities to network with people that can help you. As you had said, I have had clients who came to the city recently with their friends, and then they were in the city for a number of years with their friends and had no way of really knowing how to network. So they were just doing things together and they weren't getting involved in things. So I was helping them to say, no, this is where you need to go. This is how you need to function. These are the ways that you can network so that you can start to get into the camps, so to speak, of people who are working in the industry so that you land at the top part of the industry. You found that yourself in that moment when you were like, I'm auditioning for this and I'm going to be seen. And you were in, at that kind of breaking point where like, I need this. I want this. This is mine. And I think everyone needs to kind of, like you're saying exactly what you said, listen to your own voice. Not only were you in Sweeney Todd on Broadway, but you also were on Broadway in the visit. Can you talk a little bit about maybe that experience just to kind of give people a, a little bit of a sense of what that's like, like in that moment? So d during Sweeney, because it was the debut and, and my my Broadway debut, and it was, you know, meeting my Stephen Sondheim, I mean, I could not right. have asked a better way to make a debut. Yes, ever. I agree. When I did the visit, I felt like I was in a history lesson, okay. in, 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 the, in the history of theater lesson. I shared a dressing room with Mary Beth Peel, who was so extremely lovely, it is so extremely lovely. and. Cheetah Rivera, who I couldn't even, you know, when I, when I found out, and it was the same director, by the way. So, oh, it was okay. networking, you know, work breeds work. If they want to have a drink with you, they want to have lunch with you, then they want to work with you. So being nice to 
not, not only directors and all creatives, but being nice to your castmates will also, that's also networking and will also breed work because you always have a time where, oh, um, you know, we're looking for a blah, 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 so-and-so, you know, just got this and we need a replacement and we're going to go through this, but do you guys not again have recommendations? Always. Your castmates will recommend you for things. So Cheetah Rivera, when I got cast in the visit and that that was just a hi you want to do this an offer it wasn't even an audition it was just like <laughs> okay all <laughs> so, right you know i i just grew up loving cheetah rivera she was the um original anita in west side story on broadway and she was a big bob fossey dancer um you know she was in chicago and i went to her dress rehearsal her her own broadway show it was all about her and her life she okay. talked about you know Peter Gennaro and and the original choreography in West Side and Amazing. I mean it, it was just again That's like so cool yeah sitting there at her dress rehearsal watching her up there talk about her life and and the history of Broadway and now I'm in a show with her I'm screaming I'm sorry I get this all <laughs> excited I get yeah exactly but she she her dressing room was next door she would come into our dressing room every night and she was she talked about the the ghost of bob fossey and you know doing this show and that show and shirley mcclain and who came to the show and it was just like i said i said if cheetah would leave and she was this absolute most gracious lady and and i said to mary beth i said i don't even come here excited for the show every night i come here for this history of Broadway. Oh, I see. Uh, every night. Like I get this lesson every night. And we had Roger Reese in the show at the time who was, uh, he, I think he won the Tony for Nicholas Nickleby. He had, he had done numerous films and again, the, the nicest, most wonderful man. Um, Don McKechnie was standing by for Cheetah. It, it was just a cast full of Broadway greats. And I remember the director came and he sat next to me during lunch at a rehearsal once. And he he leaned over, he said, we've been in rooms with a bunch of really cool, fun people, haven't we? And I said, thank you. Thanks to you. We have, you know, but, but it, it was that feeling of, I am with Broadway royalty right now. And again, how am I sitting here? Yeah, you no, know, it, it was, it was just such an, a special, special experience. Something so different than Sweeney was. Sweeney, mm -hmm. everything was new and in Sondheim and, all, but, but this was just like, I'm in a, I'm in a, a history book. That's exciting. Right That's now. Exciting. So did your mom understand what that all meant in those moments that you had, or was it something that she wasn't really a part of? Did she understand that? She did, as did my dad as well. Like, you know, when when they saw me, you know, I went on tour with, with Sweeney as well. And when we got to Pittsburgh, it, you know, every news outlet, every, you know, the paper, every, oh, and so my dad was beaming just because like, oh, his daughter, his daughter made it, you know, <laughs> making it doesn't mean what people think making it means what mm -hmm. does making it mean you, yes. you know yeah. th that's another thing for for a lay person making it might mean a broadway stage or seeing their child on tv yes. or in a movie but you know making it is being satisfied i think with earning a living doing what you love doing yes so that might be different to you know, the child of certain parents or whatever, like making it is not what lay people think it is. Yes. So like I said, I just could be third chorus girl on the left and be fine because all I wanted to do was sing on Broadway, but I had no idea that things would happen the way they did. Oh, and, yeah. you know, I, I couldn't write this any better. I couldn't write this story if, if I wanted to, I, I couldn't mm -hmm. be that creative to, mm -hmm. to get to write that. So, and I, you know what, too, I think this ties back into everybody's journey is different because you started out by saying that your roommate that, you know, we are right. your roommates or roommate when you all went to the city together and she booked right away and you started the voices in the head started. And then you come to realize that your journey was meant to be different. It wasn't meant to be in that place in that time. 
Do you know what I mean? Like, like it needed to happen the way it happened. So Diana, I see that you have been in a multitude of national tours of which one you already mentioned, Sweeney Todd. Um, can you talk about those tours and when they came in your journey, like where they actually fit into your story and maybe a little bit of information about them, maybe something that might be important to the listener? Well, the very first national uh, wasn't a national, it was an international tour. Um, and I got it from an open call again. I, I saw that um, they were doing, it, it was a, a fun sort of rock and roll version of Carmen and it was in Europe. And that's kind of cool. It was very cool. I thought, well, they're going to, they're going to take this score and they're going to, um, you know, make it very pop. That could be fun, but I just want to go to Europe and travel. <laughs> and, and, and what a great way to do that. And, and so I, I went to the audition and I, you know, I got a call back. And then when I got the call again, I did not have a, an agent. And so I got the call directly that I was part of the ensemble. And then they later when the, I don't know if it, it wasn't the first rehearsal, but somehow I had to go sign something. And when I went to sign it, the director said, we made a terrible mistake. And I thought, what, you can tell me I'm, I'm, I didn't get cast. Mm -hmm. And he said, for some reason, we told you you were in the ensemble, but you're, you're a principal. You're, you're playing for Skeeta, one of the principal characters. And I was like, what? I was like, what? You know, they, they do things differently internationally than this wouldn't, well, good happen. Who knows? But I mean, it's different in New York and under union jurisdictions. Sure. Things like that don't usually happen. This sure. was some, you know, company in Europe that just came here and like, oh, I'm, uh, we're going to audition a bunch of New York people and boom, you know, and, and so I thought, well, 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 that was, what a pleasant surprise. <laughs> sure. I'll do it even more now, you know, but, but I had a great time, you know, just seeing the world with people that became lifelong friends sure. and, you know, th there's something, it doesn't always have to be about the show, the work. There's so many other things that people gain from this business. It's not all about the business. I mean, you you make lifelong friends. You get to see the world with touring. And that's always like show closes on Broadway. It goes, most of the time it goes out on tour. Yes. So it's a great way to save money. So so that happened. And I, you know, I, I got to see Europe. Um, and then I came back and, and uh, my dream role was El Donza in Man of La Mancha. And because I had a friend working at the casting company, again, no agent, I had a friend working at the casting okay, company. Okay, okay. They were looking for someone to play the matinee El Donza. So they were calling in people. I couldn't get an audition, but because I my friend worked there. There's the networking piece. There's the network. Mm -hmm. I got the audition and I got the job. And so I got to, to like, that was my dream role and I remember walking and I think I was in Colorado at the time and it was cold and it was Christmas and I was like oh my god I am like I'm I'm playing my dream role and it's Christmas time and like <laughs> I was just so happy like and sometimes we're so we're afraid to be happy because is it gonna <laughs> is it gonna end but you know is it, but we got to take those moments and know that they're few and far between mm -hmm. and so I, I know our our whole mentality is what's next like what's yeah. the next best thing that's going to happen? Like we're always like always looking ahead, always in the future, but we really need to enjoy the moments that we're in as well, because they are few and far between in this business. I don't care if you're Patty Lapone or whomever, like yes. it's a project oriented business. And that's for every parent to know. It's not that, you know, you can work a lot but it's not like tenure anywhere that you're going to have. It's project to project to project. And I know that's really scary for a lot of people, not just people starting out in the business. Like, I mean, I even have students now who say, well, I'm not going to study this in school because like, what if I, what if it doesn't happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What if it does? So, yes, you know, it's, you, you got to really follow what you want to do again and not what everyone else is telling you to do. Mm -hmm. So then those two happened. And then I just started, you know, from the Sweeney Todd tour ha uh, came, you know, I remember the producer opening the door of my dressing room and saying, you are coming out on tour, aren't you? And, and I said, well, of course I am because the money <laughs> yes. was incredible. Yes. So yeah, <laughs> I am, because then you have per diem on top of your salary 
you know, a lot of times in these cities, you have friends or family, whatever, you can stay somewhere, you could double up, whatever, you're, you know, you, you, the ways to make a lot. I bought a house because of, of touring. So yes. for parents out there to think that you can't make money in this business, I'm not saying I, I make a ton of, you know, again, project to project, but right. if you're a good saver, like I am, <laughs> When these right. projects are happening, right? Well, I've had I've had a lot of clients who have gone out on tour, and because of the money that you can save, because of the way that process works, they actually many of them have come home and had enough money to put a deposit on a home yep. or a condo or whatever it is, and that's a beautiful thing because not everyone can even say that. You know, there's many many fields that you can go into where that's an impossibility. So that is a huge deal. I'm so glad you mentioned that because people don't realize the differences because when you're on Broadway, that's great, but they don't give you a per diem. They don't give you housing when you are doing a Broadway show. That's your responsibility. And certainly you're making a lot, you know, quite a bit of money, a decent salary to be able to afford that, but you're not really able to living in New York city. It's a little bit expensive to live there and eat there and all of it. So it's hard to save money in that, in that situation, but for sure. Yeah. People definitely need to understand that. That's interesting. So what were the other tours that you have been on? If you want to just list them so that people can um, have an idea. That was Sweeney. And then I did uh, the light in the piazza. Oh, okay. I love that. Which was a, a, just a beautiful, beautiful show. Um, and I, I, you know, Adam Gettle, who wrote the show, who is the son of Mary Rogers of Rogers and Hammerstein. Oh, okay. Yeah, so he's the grandson of Richard Rogers. Yeah, he cast me himself and, you know, meeting him and, and they had just won the Tony on Broadway. That show had just won the Tony. And right. then I was still doing Sweeney when it first went out on tour. And then uh, they lost, they, one of the gals left and that gal moved into that role. And then they were needing the the cover for that for the Italian again so here was a role that I was it took place in Italy it was for an Italian mother yeah. I was the right age I was the right look and the it was a soprano it was a, a a very high singing thing and so I sort of fit the mold and because the casting director had seen me in Sweeney and so then he called me in I don't know if he would have called me in had he not seen me in Sweeney. So again, people are going to see you when you're on Broadway and people will remember you. That I, I've seen that that's happened for me to get in the door again, to at least for get other in, projects, mm -hmm. you know? Sure. So um, it'll springboard you. Do you think that if someone goes out in a national tour, that that also would give them networking opportunity to springboard them to Broadway. Do you think it works in the in the reverse? I remember the very first scene in in a chorus line. I, I don't know if it was the movie or the, I don't know if it's the same in the movie, but I remember I was watching the movie and the show. He says, "Okay, anyone with Broadway or national tour credits?" Yes, he did. It was Broadway or national tour credits. Yes. The national tour, they've worked things out with the money aspect of touring now because they're, they're hoping that these tours go out union and a lot of times they don't. And so they, they want to keep it as union as they can. And so, you know, they, they work with the producers and get these special agreement contracts and everything. So sometimes the money is going to be the same as it is on Broadway plus per diem. And other times it might be, you know, things work that way, but they are extensions of, of what just happened on Broadway, same costumes, same creatives, same sets, same everything. So the reason when people say Broadway or national tour, a lot of times you'll see on a resume, Broadway and national tour, same sentence. You know, there's not that much difference. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people go from getting a, a lead role in a national tour and then they end up on Broadway and Definitely. vice versa. I really feel like just from the history, if you look at history of how that went down, I, I think a lot of people move from a national tour, especially the lead roles from a national tour, and then end up in a Broadway show as a lead role, which is exciting. Well, even like Wicked and Hamilton, there are friends of mine who started off on the road in these tours and then end up on Broadway in the, these same shows. So mm -hmm. not, you know, not only does a show close and then goes out on tour, but shows go out on tour as they're still remaining on Broadway yes, as well. Okay, so you know, the casts interchange. Sometimes um, a cast member might want to go out and make some more money, you know, and so they'll, they'll want that per diem. So they'll like do a, you know, can I go on a tour? That's Just, interesting. That's yeah. interesting because you wonder if people who, I think the layman would look at it and wonder once someone is on Broadway, 
would they go out to tour? So you just kind of answered that question because that seems like, you know, once you're on Broadway, why don't you just stay on Broadway? Isn't that what you want to do, be on Broadway? They don't really realize the logistics of what it is and the money that can be made and how that works. So I think a parent would be in that category of person who wouldn't understand that, you know? I have had some clients who have been on Broadway in a, in lead roles. One of my clients was in Billy Elliot. He was play, he played Michael in Billy Elliot on Broadway and then did go out on tour. And he did the tour. It was more of a national tour with a couple of cities outside of the country. And he came home and then they invited him to go back out again because they needed someone in a pinch. They needed a replacement. So people that I was running into in my circles were like, why did he do that? Why didn't he just stay on Broadway? They just didn't understand, you know? So I think it's great that you brought that up, that it actually works both ways. So that's amazing. You've talked about all these experiences that you have had and how successful you have been. Um, and this was without representation, which is so unusual. And it's really a wonderful story to share and for people who are just starting out in this business to hear. So can you talk about when you did sign to either an agent or manager or both and when you receive representation and how things shifted or if they did shift and and your perspective on all of that so the whole time up until i did my first broadway show i was a backstage person looking at auditions writing them down standing in line being prepared you know and i worked i worked pretty consistently it wasn't on broadway but i still worked sure so Again, there's something to say about that, but I think you have more opportunities if you do have an agent. So I get my first Broadway show on my own. Now, do I want to actually pay an agent? <laughs> I got this myself. Right. 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 And so, uh, again, different people, you know, gave me different kinds of advice. And I thought, okay, it, it's not that everyone else in the show. I, I'm in a show with Patty Lapone. I'm in a show with Michael Cerveris, all the, all these, like, you want to be the one who doesn't have an, like, of course I have to have an agent. I want to represent myself. Now I've, I've sort of crossed a little, you know, bit of a, yes, well, just now. a little, just a little. Yeah, I think so. And so of course I want an agent. So I take my contract and I start shopping around and you start looking, which she'll see. I have a Broadway contract. Who do I want to be my agent? Oh, no, no, that's not how it works. No, that's not <laughs> how it works. Else. And so that was a big, huge wake up call. And I said, I don't get to pick who I want. I don't get to look through this agent list no. of who I want. You know, I guess, I think as consumers, just consumers in general, we think that we can just, you know, we're so used to going to Macy's and pick what, picking what we want or going to, you know, going through our phone and finding a doctor that we want to see and go, you know, or whatever it happens to be. And this industry is so different because so many clients of mine and parents of teens and kids have said, well, you know, I'm going to give us the list of who we can reach out to and we'll find an agent or manager. And they don't understand what goes into it and what, how any of that works, that it is not at all like the norm that we're used to as like just normal consumers. So what ended up finally happening? Did you find that right person? I did. I, I So the next one on my list, I actually really, really liked, I got that warm and fuzzy feeling. Right? Ah, so so okay, I sat good. there and he, he said to me, because you got this on your own, I'm only going to take 5% and it's going to be, for me. I thought, okay, you're the guy. Yes. And, and it wasn't about because of the money, but because like this guy had character, like he had, he had a soul, he integrity. You know, I, I, I felt like, oh, he's an honest person. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm, I'm going to go with him. And, you know, there are two different ways to look at this as well. I like the warm, fuzzy thing. I want to be able to feel like I can call my agent and have a conversation yes. and not have him feel like I'm taking up his time mm -hmm. because, you know, they're part of your team. Yes. He has to have a team and they're part of your team and yeah. you want to feel okay to pick up a phone and communicate, you know, or do you want the one who's going to be ruthless, maybe get you that top dollar that you wanted, but like, you're afraid of them. You know, you're afraid of interrupting their day or you feel like you work for them when in fact they work for you, yes. you know, you gotta, you gotta see what, what you like. And maybe to start out, you do need that warm, fuzzy person, mm -hmm. you know, to teach you mm -hmm. about 
what it is to have an agent and what they do, you yes. know, and then, you know, maybe then after you're establishing your career, then go for the one who's going to. Yes. Yes. Push harder, you know, yes. and it's funny because in my online courses, I teach all about what agents and managers do all day so that people understand, like you said, you, for some, you know, you were not wanting to call or not feeling comfortable having a conversation and, you know, those kind of things happen. And I think you do have to kind of learn how to talk to the agent or manager and understand what they're doing on a daily basis as well to understand what they can or what they cannot do for you. Plus you have to do, you have to be, you know, you have to take initiative. You have to be able to be prepared for everything, be looking for projects, just like you were getting backstage and you were looking at it. Now those things are available, obviously, you know, virtually or digitally through the internet. But yeah, I remember years ago, if you didn't have that newspaper on Thursday, that little backstage yeah. publication, you were out of the loop. And if you didn't get it th until three days later, you might've missed a big audition. So it is nice to not have to just do it on your own, but I think they have to be, helping, you have to help on your end with what the agent or manager is doing for you by looking for auditions that you're right for, doing the networking, you know, making the relationships and being nice to everyone, you know, oh, and being nice along the way and being that person that everybody wants to work with. It sounds like if you hadn't been that person on your one project, would you have had the opportunity to do those other projects? You also can't expect things to happen and feel entitled in any way, because that's not how this industry works at all. You have to be talented. You have to be the right type. You have to also put in the work and you have to do the networking, you know, and be available and all of the things that you've mentioned, which is wonderful. So knowing that there are young people listening to this podcast or they're watching it on YouTube. So can you sum things up a little bit for our listeners to kind of give them your general overview of advice for them moving forward um, if they are a young adult just coming out of college who is pursuing a career? Like, what do you feel would be the most important things that you would tell them to do? So when I moved to New York, I said, it's time. Uh, it is time to move to New York. Uh, I, I was in my mid-20s mm -hmm. and uh, uh, there was a room, uh, my cousin worked for an airline and had a spare room. So he was family. My parents were okay. All right, go ahead. Not that I needed yeah. their permission. I was going to do it anyway. Yeah, right. right. And I was in my mid twenties. <laughs> so I go to New York and I feel a little bit safe because I knew someone and it, he was my first cousin. I grew up with him, mm. but the very, very first night I was there, uh, I, I, it was in Queens and I could see a little piece of the New York skyline because it was lit up. It was nighttime. And it was sort of a poignant moment for me because I was in the apartment by myself and I was just looking out the window at the skyline, knowing that there's so much life and theater and everything happening right there. Like I could almost touch it, right? Like I, I could almost just touch it. And I just said to myself, how in the world am I going to make this happen? How? Like, what do you, well, okay, I wake up tomorrow. What do I do to make it happen? Yes. yes. So number one, find a place to live that you feel comfortable and safe. Number one. Number two, get yourself your survival job, whatever that means today. Back in the day, it was waiting tables. I never even waited tables. I, I, I couldn't get sure. So I, I, floor manager right off the bat because the person who was floor manager the day I came in to be hostess got fired so <laughs> so I learned by like fire right so now I'm a manager of a restaurant <laughs> <laughs> things just happen and that's what New York does things will happen out of nowhere and that's what makes it so exciting yes you're not going to live like you're you know you're not going to live a, a nine to five go to your office drive drive to your office you know sit there do your job drive home have dinner it's not if that's yeah. what you want great but be true to what you want yes you don't, like new york is every time you turn something exciting is going to happen right yeah. so place to live money coming in study Conti I continue to study, make sure your job is going to let you go to auditions. Oh yes. You know, however you find out about auditions these days, I, I know everything's online again, or yeah, I teach a lot of that in the, in the course. Yeah, so, so, you know, whatever way uh, you find out, you know, what auditions, you know, so do you go to things you're not right for? Is that the only thing happening today? That one audition I could go, but I'm really not right. Well, I don't know. Can you go, go, 
It's, it's, I it's, totally agree. It's a lesson in, you're going to learn something about yourself yes. at that audition. Yes. It's going to be like a free class. It's a free class. It's a networking and, opportunity. Yeah. You might not be right for that, but you, you'll be right for maybe something that casting office is casting down. That's the road. right. That is absolutely right. So it's, it's a lesson as many as you can. So now you have a job, you have a place to live and you have money coming in, you're studying and now you're going to auditions and you book your first job and you go and you meet people, you meet creatives, you meet choreographers and music directors. Oh, they love your voice. Oh, great. They're going to cast me in the next thing. And, you know, directors and cast mates that you're going to become friends with who are going to also recommend you for jobs. And the journey begins. Yes. You from there, something else work breeds work. That's going to happen. The next job will happen, the next job. And then, wow, you make it to Broadway. Wow, maybe that first job was Broadway. Lucky you. I remember sitting, I have to tell you this story real fast. We're sitting with, at, on, on stage in Sweeney Todd. We're all on stage and the curtain is going up and, and the girl across just out of college playing Joanna, just out of college. Nice. She, sa she says, she's getting ready and the curtain's going up. She's like, this was my first professional job right out of college. And I'm on the other side of the stage and I hear that. And I said, the curtain's going up. I didn't even care. I said out loud, my first professional job was singing La Festa Italiana at Bush Gardens in Williamsburg, Virginia. Okay. So, oh, we have two different journeys. Yeah. Two different um, ways to, to look at this. Yes. You no, know, every journey is different, but yes. we're all sitting in the same place on yes. a Broadway stage. Yes. So, yes. so whatever it is, enjoy it. Like, don't feel like you have to compare yourself to your friend who got it right out of college or, you know, or I remember one time before I did Broadway and I, and I, an agent, I was shopping for agents, sending out the pictures and one called and my roommate answered, who was a guy ended up getting the agent, getting signed by the agent. And I, I, <laughs> I'm like, but anyway, comparing to to other people in the business will do no one any good whatsoever because we're all so different, yes. every single one of us. And, you know, we, ha we have this thing to learn about ourselves and our life and, and our, you know, what we love so much and why do we love it so much and yes. um, support your friends. Yes. That's yes. really hard to do. Yes. Really, really hard when, if, if you're working, you know, waiting tables and your friends starring and, Broadway or got that or did that and then support them. Your time will come too. Mm -hmm. If you're talented and you're honest and you do the work, your time will come. Oh my God, I am such the the example of that. And and, and John Doyle, the director of Sweeney that, that that I did, he won his Tony. I think it was his first Tony. He was 56 years old and he stood on that stage and said, it's never too late people it, it doesn't matter how old you are it's never too late you know yeah. and 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 the woman who just won the emmy the um a few weeks ago from for elementary abbott elementary she's 60. oh yes oh my gosh mm -hmm. 63 it, it, oh, who cares what yes. the age is just you know if you love it it doesn't matter and if it happens if that award like what is that award oh yeah okay who who doesn't want to win that award? But like, I, I, again, I, I'm not a big fan of, the, it's always fun to watch, but again, a, a big fan of like, oh, this person was better at that role than this person was at that role. No, you know, these two roles are two totally different things. Yes. How could you even compare? Yes. You know, so it's it's all, it it's is. Like, it's like you have to live your own truth. Absolutely. You know, it truly is. Yeah. Well, you know what? This has been awesome i am just so thrilled that you're a guest on this podcast I, i'm just really happy and we're you know our podcast is just starting out we're just kind of like getting this off the ground and we have so many amazing creatives and talented people who's had all these various journeys that are coming on and i'm just so thrilled diana that you were able to do this with us today thank you so so much do you have one last thought for the listeners um, yeah, I, I, I love sharing these stories with people because it can happen. Like if you want to, to sing, dance, act, it can happen. It, it's not that far 
fetched. I, I, I remember, yeah, I, I walk down the street sometimes and I say, I, have, I live in, still to this day, uh, the old age that I am, I, I still sometimes walk down New York streets and say, I cannot believe I live in New York City and I am an actor. Oh, okay. All right. You know, this yeah. little girl from Ambridge who wanted to be on Broadway and now here you are, you, you're doing mm -hmm. it. So mm -hmm. if you want it to happen, you can make it happen. It's up to you, period. It's up to you. Do you want it or not? Thank you so much. This was awesome. Everything that you had to share was amazing. I really, really appreciate it. I know the listeners really appreciate it as well. It's Thank my you. pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Lisa. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. If you'd like to follow Diana to keep up with all that she's doing, follow her on Instagram at Demarzio Diana or visit her website at dianademarzio.com. Join me every Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern. And if you need more info, visit lbctalent.com. And you can follow me on socials at Lisa Solak underscore LBC Talent. By sharing our stories, we can help other talented individuals land the careers of their dreams.